Right now on a special edition of Currents News, a look at black history going underneath a Brooklyn church. We were the Grand Central Depot of the Underground Railroad. Forgotten past, before there was Central Park, there was Seneca Village, a place African Americans could call home. Leaving a mark, one artist looks back at his work and the joy it brings to people. I do believe that there's something higher than me that caused me to be able to do the things I'm doing. And Wonderful World, a look at Louis Armstrong's home and his ties to the Diocese of Brooklyn. I'm Christine Persichetti. Our celebration of black history begins at a Brooklyn church. It played a key role in helping escaped slaves reach freedom in the 19th century. Currents News Emily Druby is in Brooklyn Heights with a look at a former stop on the Underground Railroad. On this quaint Brooklyn Heights street sits Plymouth Church. Hidden among the pews are crucial pieces of black history. Senior Minister Brett Younger took Currents News on a tour. And so he came and, and sat in, in this pew. A marker where Abraham Lincoln sat praying for the abolition of slavery. The space where Martin Luther King Jr. preached an early version of I Have a Dream. Major pieces of history, but the most powerful piece hidden just past this door and down these steps. The basement, a stop on the path to freedom. We were the Grand Central Depot of the Underground Railroad. Enslaved African Americans stopping here for rest and food during their long and terrifying journey. No documentation exists of how many. Hidden in the sub-basement of this popular church, a windowless room with no lights. Imagine you hear someone walking down the stairs and you don't know if they're coming to bring you food or coming to take you back to slavery. Uh, the courage of those seeking freedom is Stunning. The space feels haunting and hopeful at the same time. The church's minister, Henry Ward Beecher, was a well-known abolitionist. Thousands came to hear him speak. He used all kinds of methods to help free slaves. One of the legal ways that Plymouth Church fought slavery was through mock slave auctions. During those mock auctions, people would be exposed to the atrocities of slavery while also raising money to buy real slaves freedom. A long history of fighting for what is right, one current church leaders strive to emulate, including highlighting complicated parts of their heritage, like this statue done by the infamous Mount Rushmore sculptor who had racist ties. And you know there had to be people in the church saying, hey, let's get out of politics, hey, let's stop breaking the law, we should be working to change the laws, and yet, this was a church that understood that if you're not helping the people who need the help the most, then you're not being the church. So that's put a lot of pressure on us to try to live up to our heritage. They're heavily involved in anti-trafficking and racial justice. Here at this church, not just their faith, but also their history is always challenging them, pushing them to be the best they can be. In Brooklyn Heights, Emily Druby, Currents News. Now to Central Park, where years ago it was known as Seneca Village. It was home to thousands of African Americans in the 18th century and provided them with opportunities. Jessica Easthope has more from Manhattan. That hunts other birds. 40 million people visit Central Park every year. But how many of them know about its past? In churches and schools. And Buried small. beneath the park's enormity and fame is the history of Seneca Village. We have historical records of a whole thriving community that often gets lost in, as we talk about the historical narrative of New York City as a whole. Back when Uptown Manhattan was made up of rural farmlands, an area spanning what we know now as 83rd to 89th streets was home to a thriving community on the fringe of 19th century society. Seneca Village provided a true opportunity to make a change and to pursue the American dream that was portrayed at that time. Various churches. In 1845, there were 13,000 black Americans living in New York City. Owning a certain amount of land meant you could vote. And for many black Americans, Seneca Village presented that opportunity. As people bought land, that was a kind of a deliberate political experiment. Seneca Village was made up of mostly free black Americans, but was also a sanctuary for immigrants from Germany and Ireland. Over the years, excavations have told the story of what life was like in Seneca Village, a story often skewed by racism. This area was 
labeled as shanty towns, but when we look at excavations and digs and seeing the foundations of these buildings, it was a stable and thriving community. Through eminent domain. In the late 1850s, the residents of Seneca Village were kicked out so the city could build Central Park. Historic documents show many were never fairly paid for the land they owned. As long as you are compensated in a just manner. The rich history of Seneca Village can teach us a lot about the world we live in today. Seneca Village can be used as a lens of how we want to see our community and our environment change for the better. Education allows history to be rediscovered. And beneath Central Park, more is waiting to be found. In Manhattan, Jessica East Hope, Currents News. One Catholic Academy in Brooklyn is also diving through history. The students of Our Lady of Perpetual Help held a series of presentations this February, highlighting prominent black figures who have been recognized throughout history, such as Maya Angelou, Michelle Obama, and Jesse Owens. Joining in on the fun, New York State Assemblyman Peter Abadi stopped by the classroom to speak to students about their projects. During another class at Our Lady of Perpetual Help this month, students got to ride in a flying classroom. You ready to go? Ready to go! All right, ready, hit it. Woo! This lesson was led by Captain Barrington Irving, the first black man and youngest person ever to fly solo around the world. The Flying Classroom is a STEM digital curriculum targeting grades K through 8 that challenges students to design innovative solutions to the problems Captain Irving investigates. The STEM courses will be part of the diocesan curriculum for the 2021 school year. One Queens Catholic is on a mission to bring black Catholics back to the church. Dr. Anthony Andrews is recruiting for the Knights of St. Peter Claver. It's the largest historically African-American Catholic lay organization, which at one point was thriving in the diocese. On Wednesday, he explained to Currents News what the organization is about and why it's so needed. Well, we're a group of Catholics who have uh, come together to form an organization in 1909, which was based on service. and. We couldn't get into other organizations, unfortunately. Um, you know, there were different things that they would say that we didn't meet the criteria to belong to other organizations. So because we couldn't get into organizations such as the Knights of Columbus and some other Knights organizations, a group of Catholics and lay ministers, Jesuit priests, came together and formed the Knights of Peter Claver. Wow. And now tell me, how old is the organization? And I see you're wearing a medal. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, this is actually a medallion that was given to... Uh, the offices of the Knights of Peter Claver and members who were extremely active did uh, so many service hours with the organization in 1999. It commemorated our 90th anniversary. We are now 111 years old and uh, it's still going strong. Wow. I know the council at St. Clement Pope was a pretty active one years ago, but from what I understand, but what happened? So, you know, we had a time when most of the people who were in the organization, Knights of Peter Claver and Ladies of Missouri, were very active in the uh, Office of Black Ministry, but most of them were older, mm. and they got involved at a later stage of the game of their activism in the Catholic Church. Younger people such as myself, there were very few of, and uh, the ones who were in the organization became involved with other organizations and other things. Uh, after so many years, I've gotten many things done in my life, including uh, achieving a doctorate. And so now that I've done these things, I thought it was about time for me to come back and continue to revive, um, because I know they've been trying to revive the organization, the Knights. The ladies have been active in court council uh, 333, but we have not gotten the Knights as active as we've wanted to over the last several years. So you've said that some black Catholics don't feel comfortable at church. Why is that? And what can the church do to make them feel more welcomed? I think the church has to begin to open up dialogue with black Catholics. And I think that, you know, uh, the church has been hesitant to do this in the past. Sure, there are some ministers, some pastors, some bishops who have done this, such as Bishop Gregory. But a lot of churches are just uh, hesitant to do that because they're afraid of the backlash that may come from discussing things that were not discussed in the past. You have to begin to discuss the past of the Catholic Church to begin to uh, think about where we're going in the future. And that past, unfortunately, does include racism. It, it includes not letting black Catholics be as involved with certain things um, or discouraging them from being involved. And I think that's a shame. I think we've got to be able to have these discussions to talk about the issues that black Catholics face 
because Black Catholics face issues that others do not. So I hear you have a big event coming up next week. Tell us briefly about it. March 6th, we have our virtual initiation, and um, I think it's going to be fantastic. It's the first time we're doing that virtual initiation. Some of the other Knights organizations have already started doing this. And what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can make sure that we initiate as many Knights and ladies as we possibly can. There's not a need for Knights and ladies to be activated in the church anymore. They are activated, mm -hmm. but there's a need to come together to talk about the issues that impact us and that ultimately impact the Catholic Church. So many blacks have left the Catholic Church over the last few decades, and it's because they didn't feel as comfortable as they would feel in other churches. We've got to begin to have the dialogue, to have the discussions about social justice and about those issues that impact black Catholics so that we can have a very vibrant and active Catholic ministry that includes and involves black Catholics in a way where we feel included. And again, that was Dr. Anthony Andrews from the Knights of St. Peter Claver. If you'd like to be part of the first virtual national in initiation on March 6th, head on over to kofpc.org and hit the Join Now button. But hurry, applications need to be submitted by the 26th. Still to come on this special edition of Currents News, artists who have shaped and continue to shape history. He lived through the Civil Rights era. He, he lived in that time. And yet, he was still able to become an, an American icon. The roots of jazz legend Louis Armstrong tracing back to the Diocese of Brooklyn. And a look at the man behind these iconic sculptures scattered throughout the city. Plus, one woman's efforts to connect Catholics of color. All that when we return. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. Louis Armstrong's famous taps on the trumpet, actually partly inspired by the church, as we take a personal look into the life of a music icon. Cards News' Emily Druvy got an inside look at the Louis Armstrong House and Museum in Corona, Queens. A space untouched by time, a melody that lasts forever. It feels like Louis and Lucille just stepped out for a moment and they're coming right back. The Corona Queen's home of American icon Louis Armstrong. The now museum made possible by his wife Lucille, who wanted to preserve his legacy. Workers say you can feel him when inside. When I first got here, I went through the house. You could feel almost feel him in the house. This space temporarily closed during the pandemic, but executive director Regina Bain gave Currents News a tour. Armstrong's workspace, tape decks in the corner, a painting by Tony Bennett hangs on the wall. Were they good friends? Yes, they loved each other. On the desk, handwritten notes. And he talks about listening to the hymns, the soprano solo, the church choir. A preserved bedroom, Lucille's gloves lay on the dresser. In the corner, a space to pray. She was a devout Catholic. Lucille's Catholicism was a big part of her life, and she actually worshipped right around the corner from the house here. At Our Lady of Sorrows, Lewis was more spiritual than religious, although researchers discovered he was baptized Catholic right after birth, likely because of his Catholic grandmother. Before the pandemic, people from all over the world visited the space, drawing inspiration from his talent and his story. Slavery had just ended in the United States when he was born in 1901. He lived through the civil rights era. He, he lived in that time, and yet, he was still able to become an, an American icon that represented the beauty and the innovation and the excellence of this country. And that's who he is as a black person, as a black man, and as a musician. Soon visitors will be able to feel even closer to the jazz legend. The Armstrong Center is being built across the street. Extensive archived sound will be on display an important legacy forever preserved in this quiet Queens neighborhood. In Corona, Emily Druby, Currents News. 
Later on in the newscast, we have more jazz for you, this time from musician Richard DeBrew Jr. You'll want to stick around for that. We now turn our attention to Prospect Park. A black artist is reflecting on his work that can be found in parks across the city. Jessica Eastove got the chance to speak with him and shares his story. The house and I in Swahili. At 90 years old, Otto Niels has made his mark on New York City and black history. The connection between him and me. Though he has art scattered all over, he's one of the first black artists to have work featured in a New York City park. I run into a whole lot of people in the area. They tell me about how much they enjoy being with Peter and Willie when they were growing up. Molten bronze. Niels is self-taught. The array of materials he works with is one of the many things that makes his art unique. Some of his artwork you can even hear. Neil's sculpture, Peter and Willie, was installed in Imagination Playground in Prospect Park in 1997. The characters come from the literary works of Brooklyn-born author Ezra Jack Keats. They were first introduced in his book, The Snowy Day. And on this snowy day, Niels remembered reading it with his children and what he thought of the book at the time. I thought it was very odd <laughs> to have a white writer and illustrator to concentrate on a, a little black boy. The characters touch Neil's life and the sculpture, which was named a literary landmark, has touched the lives of so many others. My children, they're a teenager now. They grow up playing with this. Christine Palmer comes to Prospect Park almost every day. She raised her children here, and now as a nanny, she's helping to raise more kids, all of whom have a connection with Peter and Willie. They always sit in the chair, they always pet in the dog, and it looks so real. When Niels created the sculpture, the bronze was bright blue. Its vibrance has since rubbed off. But Niels says it means his work is serving its purpose, that children have been interacting with it all these years. Peter and Willie is part of Neil's living legacy. He believes the sculpture is one of the reasons he was given the talent to create. I do believe that there's something higher than me that caused me to be able to do the things I'm doing. You know, I don't take credit for it. There's some of the force. Peter and Willie have been sitting in the same place for decades. But the generations of children who played here can all trace a piece of their own history back to this spot. In Prospect Park, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. A woman in Texas wanted to make sure people of color were represented in all Catholic writing and speaking circles. So she created a platform that helps conference organizers find more diverse speakers for their events. I spoke with Letitia Ochoa Adams, the creator of CatholicSpeakersOfColor.com on Thursday, and asked what her inspiration was to create the website. I was having a really hard time trying to figure out exactly what I could do to try to help bring um, awareness to black speakers, you know, Hispanic speakers, and how I could try to help kind of combat the issue of racism within our church and our country it was a little bit overwhelming. And then I just came up with this idea that I could just make a list of people that I knew. I, I've kind of met a lot of people here and there in my time in Catholic circles. And so I thought I could just come up with a list. I can just share that list. And then um, before I knew it, people were volunteering to help make a website, add profile pictures. Everyone was very excited. I started getting information from people like, put me on the list, put me on the <laughs> list. And so, um, then it just turned into this beautiful website that I am so proud of. That's so great. Why is the site needed? You know, the Hispanic population in the Catholic Church continues to grow. Are they not being represented at Catholic conferences and events? I think for Hispanics, it's a lot easier for us to get mm -hmm. represented, but a lot of times we get asked to do um, Spanish-only conferences. Nah. And so I kind of wanted to create a space where we were also known to be able to speak in English conferences. And then there's the Black Catholic community, who I feel a lot of times doesn't get represented in a lot of Catholic conferences. And, and a lot of times it's just simply because people don't know of anyone. Hmm. A lot of times Catholic conferences are organized by who knows who, and I was very lucky to um, get put in the spotlight by a friend of mine, Jennifer Fulweiler. And so I just wanted to be able to offer some of that spotlight that I got from her um, onto other people, especially black Catholics. All right, now you've only been up and running for less than six months, but you say you've already seen a positive impact. Tell us about that. 
Oh yeah, everyone that um, the majority of people who've contacted me about the website are so excited about it. They're so happy to have this resource to see um, these speakers that are on this website who are, I mean, I find so much joy just scrolling through it myself, mm -hmm. just to see the beautiful smiling faces and to know that um, these speakers have so much more, so much to offer to the church and to Catholic events to create more space for more stories, which is always a great thing. All right, one thing I love about your site is how organized it is. Talk about the filter you created. I love I love the filter option <laughs> where you can kind of see who speaks on what topics. I think a lot of times too, um, especially in light of 2020, which was a crazy year, um, it seems as if Catholic, uh, Catholics of color can only speak on the issue of racism or how racism has impacted us. And while it's so important for us to have a space to talk about those things, we're also whole human beings who have stories about why we're Catholic, why we love the church and what we have to bring as far as um, the pro-life issue or youth ministry. There's just so many other avenues and it's really made my heart so happy to see how passionate these speakers are about their topics and they know where their gifts are. They know what they're good at talking about. And, um, and I just hope that they, I just get to watch them run and just take over. <laughs> And that was Letitia Ochoa Adams, the creator of CatholicSpeakersOfColor.com. If you'd like to be featured on the website or if you're looking for a public speaker, check out CatholicSpeakersOfColor.com. Helping turn prison inmates' lives around. Coming up, one chess master's act of kindness to help others. A man who made history is now helping others. Justice Williams became the youngest African-American chess master ever at the age of 12. Now in his 20s, he's using his expertise to help inmates at the St. Louis County Justice Center, creating the first ever chess tournament at the prison. We're trying to bring more faces into chess. Um, so we got to get into the underrepresented communities and in, in the jails, it's beautiful. Like there's a lot of great players in here. Some people just, they just move so confidently like they've been playing all their life. The winner of the tournament will play against Justice. No word yet on when the final match will take place, but I'm sure it'll be quite the game. And that is Current News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. We invite you now to sit back, relax, and enjoy the sweet sounds from Richard DeBru Jr., a Christian jazz musician, as he plays his song By and By in honor of Black History Month. Hope to see you again next time. Thank mm -hmm. you. 